it's a lovely spring morning here. Um, I'm glad to be speaking to a group of teachers because uh, I've been surrounded by teachers for the last, uh, oh, probably 60 years. My mother-in-law was a teacher, two sister-in-laws were teachers, my son's a teacher, his wife's a teacher, so <laughs> it's no strange environment for me. Thanks for all your questions. I mean, if you look at this pile of papers here, I've got so many, and I'm not going to be able to get through them all, but I'm going to do my best and uh, try and take as many as possible in the half hour that we've got. Uh, the first one comes from Claire in um, Huxley Primary School. I'm not quite sure where that is, but in Huxley. And uh, she said, how did you cope with the isolation part, just being alone with your own mind? Well, let me, first of all, just give a bit of background before um, answering directly that question. Um, I, for many years, I, I worked as a hostage negotiator, and that, as you appreciate, is a fairly dangerous job. I mean, I began way, way back uh, negotiating with um, General Amin for people who'd been captured um, and put into concentration camps in Uganda. I, I lived, worked in Uganda for a number of years. Um, I then worked in pretty well every difficult trouble spot of the world in conflict resolution and various other things. And then I became more actively involved in uh, hostage negotiation work when I was a member of the private staff of the Archbishop of Canterbury. I'm not ordained, by the way. I never have had any vocation to that particular um, calling. Um, so I'm a layman and have been um, working from a church base for much of my life, but as, as a layman. Um, I negotiated in, in Iran with revolutionary guards, got into the Avene prison to enable people to come out of there, uh, with Gaddafi, face to face with Gaddafi, various other things. And of course, when you do a dangerous job like that, you realize that things might go wrong. They went wrong for me in Beirut. Trust was broken between myself and the people with whom I was negotiating. And I was captured. I was told I could see somebody who was ill and about to die. I said, if I come with you, you'll keep me. And they said, no. And I had to debate with myself whether to go or not. And uh, I don't think any of us are full of altruism. I'm certainly not. I just felt that if I didn't go and if that man died, I'd have to live with my conscience for the rest of my life. And uh, so I went. So there's always a personal motive in things when you think you're doing something for other people. Anyway, I was captured and um, was in uh, solitary confinement for almost five years, 1,763 days in all. For the last uh, few weeks, I was with other people, with John McCarthy, Brian Keenan, uh, Terry Anderson. Not a bigger pardon, not Brian Keenan. Brian was released uh, a year before me. Um, Tom Sutherland and Terry Anderson, the American journalist. And I'll refer to that later in some of the questions. The situation in solitude was fairly extreme. I was chained to the wall for 23 hours and 50 minutes a day. I had um, no books or papers for almost four years. Um, I was in a room where, if I was in an upper room, sometimes in a basement, but if I was in an upper room, Metal shutters were put in front of the window so no natural light came in. Uh, I had one visit to the bathroom a day. When anyone came in the room, I had to pull a blindfold over my eyes. Um, and so I didn't have any conversation of any significance or any dealings or saw anybody for all that time. So it was, uh, I slept on the floor and it was a case of um, absolute uh, isolation. And uh, it's, a, it's a situation, of course, through which um, not too many people have passed. Many people have been through worse situations. But um, it is uh, the reason I, I'm glad to speak about it is because I think it's from extreme situations that you can take some understandings that are applicable to the, what you might say so-called normal life. So how did I cope with it? That's um, Claire's first question. Being alone with your own mind. Well. First of all, 
uh, when I was was captured, I was I, I was angry. I was angry with myself for taking so many risks, and I was angry with my captors for breaking trust. And somehow I had to come uh, control that and get hold of it. Um, I, I've written a book called Out of the Silence, which is a book of poetry and reflections, some of which had their genesis in uh, captivity. And I said, anger is like a consuming fire, seeking all whom it may devour. Do not extinguish the flames totally, but warm yourself by the gentle glow of the embers. And by that I meant, you know, that if anger gets the better of you, it does you more harm than those against whom it's held. But it's a natural force. You can't, um, you know, everybody has it and experiences it from time to time. <clears throat> Somehow the, what one needs to do is take that force and try and turn it creatively. It took me about a week to come to terms with the situation. I didn't eat for a week. Um, and after that, uh, they told me they'd make me eat if I didn't eat. And by then I got control of my anger and got control of myself. And I said three things when I was captured. I, I don't know where these things came from. I said, um, no regrets, no self-pity, no over sentimentality. Don't regret what you've done because you did what you believe to be right. And if you regret, you'll be demoralized. No self-pity. Don't feel sorry for yourself because there are plenty of people in worse situations. And um, no other sentimentality, sentimentality. Don't say, oh, if only, if only I'd, you know, been a better husband, better father, taken more time with the family. You can't live your life again. One had to live it from that point onwards. And so I suppose in answer to your question, uh, Claire, really what I'm saying is I had to try and take control of the situation. And it took time, there's no doubt about it, because I was afraid also. And, you know, today a number of people will be afraid, not necessarily in your profession, but a number of people will be afraid because they've lost jobs or there may not be a job for them. And eventually, as this process went on, as I was kept in captivity day in and day out, day in and day out, I began to say to myself, take this as an opportunity. Um, this relates to a next question from Patrick, from someone called Brookfields, who said, how did you learn to cope with the concept that you do not know when the isolation may end, if at all, in your personal case? Yeah, you know, that's a good question. Um, people serving a normal prison sentence uh, in the civilian prison, of course, normally, unless they're an IPP prisoner, have um, a terminal point. They know that after X number of years, there's a good chance they'll be released. But you don't know that as a hostage. Um, and somehow what, what one needs to do is learn to live for the day. Um, we have the fond illusion when life is relatively normal, as it isn't at the moment, but we have that fond illusion that we are in control and we know what's going to happen tomorrow. We don't, in fact. But now um, that is made more obvious because we are much more uncertain about what the future is going to hold for us and for the community and for the world. Um, and somehow you have to learn to live for now. Uh, that doesn't mean to say you don't plan for the future. Of course you do. You've got to make sensible plans. But living for the moment, recognizing that this is your life now and trying to make that as full as possible. Um, and that's, again, in a, <coughs> a situation of isolation, not, not easy. Um, I'm looking for another question that relates to that. Um, but there is one somewhere, and I can't remember who 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 um, who gave it to me. But uh, anyway, um, living for the moment, being as creative as you can in the moment, recognizing that now is your life. That was the way in which I coped with the fact that I didn't know when isolation would end. And of course. <coughs> 
one did have to face really quite unpleasant situations. I was tortured and I did have a mock execution uh, when I was told I had five hours to live and was brought into a room um, where um, the gun was put to my head. I, I actually thought that was the, the end of it. As it is, it wasn't. It was just the end of an interrogation period. Um, Christian Grundy from Valley Garden Middle School. Hello, Christian. Um, if your faith supported you through your imprisonment, do you feel society's understanding of the mental and physical health benefits of faith and spirituality are currently lost? Well, it gives me a chance to talk about faith. Um, I, I <coughs> Uh, as I said, I worked from a church base all my life, never had a vocation to the ordained ministry. I don't suppose that I could be really described as an orthodox uh, Christian. And um, I, I rebel really against the description of being religious, because that implies to me something that I, I don't particularly um, relish. That doesn't mean to say I'm not, not a believer at all. Um, somebody asked a question later on about how did one feel and the, did one, I never felt the, the close presence of God, I have to admit that. I felt totally alone. Um, I have never believed that if you have faith, then because of that, you're given special protection. You know, that God would say, well, X over there is a believer, look after him and the rest can go their own way. I've never believed that. It's a lot of nonsense, I think. Um, I think one of the great things about faith is that it enables you to maintain hope. And I, let me put it in, in this way. Um, I could say in the face of my captors, you have the power to break my body and you've tried. You have the power to bend my mind and you've tried but my soul is not yours to possess. Now, I have great difficulty, and I imagine everybody would, in defining more precisely what I mean by soul. But in that context, I meant the whole person, the total person that I am, body, mind, spirit. And that that would never be taken by anybody, even if I was, uh, was killed, simply because uh, my soul my whole body, my whole person, lay in the hand of God, not in the hands of other people to take, even though they took my life. And that's a very simple belief, I, I, I know, um, but it was enough to enable me to maintain hope. And I think if in situations of extremity and situations of difficulty, you can maintain hope, then you're, you're halfway home. And I think that's true today. Um, that if you can maintain hope uh, and keep that alive, it, it, it enables you to face the most um, unpleasant and difficult situations. Uh, Claire from Richard Coates School, CV School, uh, was there a point when you thought, I would rather be dead than endure this? In essence, you gave up or tried to rebel against your captures. Um, was there a point where I thought I'd rather be dead? Yeah, there was actually. Um, ha, ha, I'm not sure I really wanted to be dead, but towards the end of my experience, um, after about four and three quarter years, something like that, I became very ill with a, a bronchial infection. And it was pretty serious. Uh, they move me at that point to be in with other hostages and uh, of course i was chained they were chained and we had sort of you know that much room between us and it was a, a very difficult time i couldn't lie down at night i had my lungs kept filling with fluid i had to sit with my back against the wall and i was struggling for breath and I do remember saying to myself at that point, well, death would almost be preferable to what is now becoming a living death. 
And then something said within me, don't give up, keep going, keep, keep, hold, hold on. And somehow I did. And there's also a, a rather a moving little story. Um, Terry Anderson, who was the American journalist who was captured and he'd been there for a number of years. And of course we met for the first time in this, in this rather unusual circumstance. And when I was at night struggling to get my breath, leaning against the wall, he'd lean across and he just put his hand on mine. Didn't say anything. And, you know, I found that tremendously comforting and supportive. And as I've said before, I've been to see people in hospital when they've been particularly ill and perhaps not um, fully with it. And I've wondered what, if anything, to say. And I realize it's not so much what you say, it's the fact that you're there, the fact there's another human being who actually cares enough. And that simple touch and that care meant uh, a great deal. Rebel against your captors. Well, there's not much point in doing that. Uh, Brian, Brian Keenan, who was held hostage, and I was never with Brian, um, uh, and never, never spent any time with him in captivity. But I'm told that Brian, being a very temperamental, fierce Irishman, would attack them uh, when they came in the room, he was chained up, of course, and he could do nothing. And as a consequence, was very severely beaten on a number of occasions. Um, and uh, I, so that form of rebellion really didn't get you very far. But one thing I've, I learned too about this, that everybody has their own way of surviving. It could well be, you know, that Brown's aggression against them was his way of affirming his own identity and affirming that he still had a measure of freedom to do uh, to do that. And so um, I, I learned in that, don't be too judgmental and critical about the way other people behave in situations because it's their way of, of surviving and getting through the situation. Um, did you feel you already had the personal attribute to cope with your situation? Or did they develop as a result of the terrible situation you found yourself in? That's in Philippa, uh, at the Durham Sixth Form Centre. Um, well, I had contemplated, obviously, uh, prior to captivity, wondering what it would be like. Um, and I, as I mentioned earlier on, met many people who have been in captivity and uh, still do today. Um, but I founded um, a number of years ago, an organization called Hostage International. You can find it on the web where we give support to hostage families and returning hostages. And so I've been associated with that side of things for a long, long time. And there are still lots of people um, who, are, who are being held hostage um, you can probably think of some in, in various countries around the world. And the number of people who have returned and do need active support of one kind or another. But did you feel you had the personal attributes to cope with your situation? Um, no, not really. Um, I had no idea. I got some idea of what it would be like. And one has taken part and, and seen you know, simulation exercises where people, um, mainly from the armed forces and others, have been put into situations of uh, capti uh, simulating captivity um, and uh, being treated in a fairly rough way. But they always know that at the end of five days, it's going to be over, they're going to be out. When you're a hostage, as was said earlier, you know, you have just no idea how long you're going to be there. And uh, what I discovered, to my great surprise, that I had within me resources that I never knew I had. Now, that is something that's directly, I think, applicable to the situation today. You know, we're thrown into an uncertain situation. We're thrown into a situation where some of the old certainties have gone and may never return. And it is quite... Uh, quite possible that within this situation 
uh, a number of people will discover that they have gifts and abilities they didn't know they had and that they could develop and perhaps utilize in different ways. For some, this will be uh, a life-changing experience. Um, it was for me, I'll refer to that later because someone asked that question. Um, and I discovered, I mean, if, if someone were to say, to let me, let me give an example. Uh, just before um, I was captured, I went with my wife and son, who was quite a young lad at the time, and we went to uh, visit our sister-in-law, uh, her sister-in-law, who lived at that time in San Francisco. <coughs> and uh, we went to, did the tourist thing and went to the um, present or the jail, Alcatraz. We went around that jail, which is now a tourist site, obviously it's no longer used as prison. And for a moment, they put us in the punishment cell, which was totally dark. We all went in this cell and they closed the door. We were there for no more than three or four minutes. And then they let us out and they said, you know, um, we, the prisoners on punishment were put in here for five or six days at a time. And I thought to myself, oh crap, I never stand there. And then two weeks later, something like two weeks later, I found myself in this underground cell in Beirut um, for five years. Now, I would never, ever have thought that I could cope with that. But somehow one found the resources from within and you never know what is there until you actually put to the test, so to speak, and discover that you have resources that you didn't know you had. And also, I mean, uh, there's another question. Uh, oh, it's, it's this one. I think it's from, from Debbie. If you had access to pen and paper, what would you have been writing? Well, that leads me into the point that um, what I had to do in that situation was there was very limited physical exercise that I could do on the end of a chain. And I've never particularly enjoyed physical exercise, but it, I recognize it's necessary. And I did what I could by whilst being chained by the hands and feet. But what was so important was to keep mentally alive, to keep mentally fresh, um, if one could, but without any external stimulation. There was nothing, no stim external stimulation at all, apart from, you know, being threatened and so on. And in this uh, situation, I, I realized that I had to keep mentally alive. Now, I'd heard of people who'd been kept in solitary and who had become in incredibly depressed and uh, fallen into um, mental illness. And I wondered if that was an inevitable consequence of being in this type of situation. Uh, where, what happens when you are in isolation is there is a tendency to become highly introverted, to look within. And anybody who does that with any degree of honesty will, of course, discover that they are a, a mixture, light and dark, good and evil, call it what you will, negative, positive doesn't matter. There is that duality within us. And if you begin to dwell on the negative side, you will uh, kind of easily fall into depression. The way to deal with it is to say, look, I'm a normal human being. None of us are perfect. None of us have led a perfect life. We've all done things in the past of which, of which we are ashamed. Um, somehow, take a realistic approach and try and work for a degree of inner harmony, of inner integration. There's a question later on, which I'm not going to be able to get to now, but deals with this and I'm answering it and I can't remember who, who gave the question, but um, one of the ways in which I dealt with it was through the, by the use of language. I've always been, someone asked me a question, what did you miss most apart, well, apart from family, friends and freedom? I miss books. Uh, I'd always been a reader and I was very glad that I'd been a reader and had also committed to memory, prose and poetry, because I had that store in my mind, which I could draw on and, and utilize. And I began to write in my head, my first book called Taken on Trust, 
which is still available if anybody wants to read it, is about the experience was written in my head. And I began to um, write poetry in my head. I had no pencil and paper, and that's why it was all written in my head. Um, and one of the reasons, I think, for beginning to write poetry was that through the use of language, I was trying to find that degree of inner harmony. Um, I have the belief that good language, like good music, has the capacity to breathe harmony into the soul. And that's what I was seeking, to try and find that degree of inner harmony. I'm often use the analogy again that the brain is like a, a muscle you know you need to exercise it and if you don't exercise it then it dies on you slowly slowly and how often do you see that in people older people um i'm 81 next month and uh, i try and keep alive mentally alive physically i'm not as active as i i, I should be or could be but I try and keep myself mentally alive because that's the way uh, to go forward, to keep yourself, to always be keep an inquisitive mind, to want to learn new things. And in this situation of isolation, there are loads of opportunities. At the moment, I'm in, I'm in um, voluntary isolation up here in Suffolk. I haven't been seen people or had a long conversation with people apart from on the web uh, for several weeks. And um, I find it really to be <laughs> a good experience. It gives me a break from the normal routine of life and to explore some avenues that I've never had time to explore before. Has, how's, uh, how has your experience changed you as a person? Um, from David, David Stevens in Parkview Primary. Well, David, it, it's changed me very considerably because when I eventually came out of captivity, um, because of the experience, I said, I'm not going to take up my old job. And I'd always had a salary job all my life. And I said, I'm not going to do that. Um, now I'm going to uh, take uh, the time to give myself to some of the things that I think are really important in life for me to work with the homeless, to work with prisoners, to work with those who have been um, taken hostage, hostage international. And so I said, and I'm not gonna take money from those charities. I'm gonna earn my own living by writing and lecturing. Now, prior to the experience, I wouldn't have had the guts to say, I'm gonna give up a salary job, you know, particularly when you've got a young family, you've got a mortgage and so on. And I thought, I can do it. If I can go through that experience, then I can do it. And I've been doing that now for many years. Don't earn a vast salary when you write um, or when you lecture. I mean, I depend on the income from lecturing and from, from writing. Um, <clears throat> it's coming up to half past, and I'm going to have to stop. Let me just see if there's one more question. Oh, th this is the question I was referring to earlier from uh, as an MFL teacher, I'm interested in the use of vocabulary, grammar and syntax. Did your vocabulary deplete? No, it, it during your imprisonment, it didn't deplete. I think it increased and I um, tried to develop, uh, develop it through the writing of, of, of poetry. And uh, I published a book called Out of the Silence which is a book, not just of poetry, but of poetry reflections. I should add that prior to ex this experience, I was never a great fan of poetry. I, I still, still are, I'm not really. I don't, a lot of it, I, I just can't take to at all. But um, in Out of the Silence, I try to express in a concise way something of the deeper emotions that I felt and that others have felt. So I think my vocabulary expanded um well i think that's it it's coming up to half past i've got to stop i mean i've hardly dealt with any of your questions and so i, I i'm i'm sorry i've done my best in this half hour to try and uh, to try and cover cover the ground and um, maybe we can have another session some other time i hope you found this 
to be of some value. And um, let me wish you all the very best in the future. And if I can also say, um, I, I know for a fact that teachers are often un undervalued. Well, there are a lot of us who really appreciate what you do. And thank you all.